good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Anne-Marie Willer. I'm Director of Preservation Services at NEDCC, and I'm really pleased to see you here this afternoon for this session on preserving digital collections. How many of you have uh, digital collections of uh, documents in your collections? Documents? How about photographs? Okay. How about audio? Do you have digital audio? Yeah. Digital video? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is right. This is, I, you're the audience I would expect to see in here. So, um, many of our collections have little bits of these. Uh, some of you have, may have larger collections than others of digital collections. And we're going to talk today about how to make sure that those are preserved and sustained over time. Uh, for those of you who like to have a glimpse ahead of what's coming, this is the agenda that I'll be following today. It may help you organize your notes if you're taking them. However, this session is also being recorded uh, for access on the Sustainable Heritage Network in the future. I want to say a little bit about what a digital collection is. Um, maybe I should say what a digital collection is not. There are situations where sometimes we'll just take a quick um, scan of something in our collections and maybe it's too attached to an inventory so we have a visual reference of what that item looks like um, or it's just a one-off for, for something and it's not really a file that it's preservation quality, it's not a file you intend to keep, and it's not a file that's going into a digital collection that you're building. In contrast to if you sat down and said, we're going to digitize all of our photographs from the 19th century, you would be creating a digital collection of those photographs. It's more deliberate in its, its form. Um, these sort of one-off files that happen, those don't, um, we don't think of those as collections because they're usually not the same quality. We don't have, they're, they're sort of meant to be ephemeral. So to start with, I'm going to go pretty quickly through the challenges um, associated with digital preservation because I think these will be familiar to you um, and if there is something in these challenges that isn't is, is not quite clear to you or is um, technically unfamiliar uh, feel free to ask you know make a, a mark in your notes and and ask me towards the end um, or refer back to this presentation we'll slow down a little more when we start talking about the strategies for preservation and assessment. So I'll be talking, uh, I have about six risks or so that are technological and six that are organizational. And we'll just go through those now. Um, first off, of course, is technological risks. Uh, if you have obsolete hardware or uh, what I would say is almost obsolete hardware, for example, the USB flash drive, who knows how much longer we'll be using those. Um, these create a risk for you for losing your, you losing access to your collections because you may not have the drives you need or the ports that you need to, to use these media. So for example, the new laptop that I was given at work does not have a CD-ROM, uh, DVD-ROM drive, um, which is mostly okay um, for what I need, but it was still a little bit of a surprise to me. <laughs> Also, it has it has um, different ports than my last one, so something to keep in mind. So related, of course, to obsolete hardware is obsolete software. Some of these logos may look familiar to you if you've uh, used early Macs or you remember WordPerfect. Um, these are examples of uh, software that. Uh, most of us don't have access to anymore, and, and you may even experience this in your personal life. Maybe you have, you know, letters you typed to a friend using Windows, in Windows 95, and maybe you can't open them anymore. Um, also, sometimes software can install incorrectly, incorrectly, or can update incorrectly. It can become corrupted, and so in that case, even if you have the correct software, um, things still may not be working and talking to each other so that you can access those files. Another technological risk, hardware software failure. Um, you know, there are, have you ever just had your computer just go black? And just, okay, 
<laughs> it happened to me about six weeks ago. It's really like it wasn't the normal death throes that, that I've experienced with previous computers where they were showing me signs that it was not working. This one just just up and stopped working. And that's, um, of course, I'm a preservation librarian, which means, of course, I have backup files of my files at home and all of that. I have unusual standards for my family photographs. Um, <laughs> But still, it's like, oh, you know, when was the last backup? And so I don't need to go on about the technological risk of hardware and software failure, but I think we've all, if you've experienced that, you know that it can be so, feel so dramatic and unexpected. Uh, moving more quickly through, uh, data corruption and inauthenticity are other technological risks. Uh, the photo that you see here in the lower left is is corrupt. That's why you're not seeing the image on the bottom half of that. Um, that certainly happened to me. And uh, the example on the right, that's um, <laughs> an example uh, that's from Wikipedia. And my guess is that that Wikipedia entry was hacked because I'm not thinking that da -na 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 Batman is really what. Uh, was intended for a uh, background article on Batman. And, and so <laughs> my message is, is that that's uh, the authenticity of that entry has, is a, is a not authentic, shall we say. <laughs> and two more technological risks, lots of context. So what I have here is just a screenshot of a of a folder full of JPEGs, and they have names like MG5410 and um, MG5411. You know, and I, I've lost the context. I don't have any other metadata files that go with these. And the file names, you know, you're not supposed to put all your metadata into the file name. I mean, there's pros and cons of that, but like there's nothing in this file name that's helping me. It's not telling me if these are like images of the pages of a book, if these are photographs, uh, maybe it's both, I, I don't know. So, loss of context. Another one, of course, is, excuse me, is IP and copyright restrictions. So, when we're trying to do preservation on digital files, as you will see, some of those strategies um, involve migration of those files, um, copying those files into multiple locations and things like that. So, you need uh, to have the rights to manipulate and copy and move around the files in those ways. And often you do in the context of your, um, your institutional mission, but still it can be a concern if, uh, if for whatever reason the collection material that you're working with doesn't, doesn't allow you to do that. So that was a really quick tour through technological list, uh, risks. I would imagine that some of those sounded familiar or you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense, no surprises. So the second part of the challenges, I wanna talk about organizational risks. And the first one is your, your, your institution's mandate. Do you have, does your institution have the right to care for these digital collections, to collect them and care for them over time? Do you have uh, the commitment to do so, to actually carry out those activities? Or maybe it's that you have an actual mandate or there are laws that say your institution has to collect and care for these digital collections. Um, you need to understand what kind of mandate or reason for collecting you have because if you don't have that or if it's not articulated and well understood, that can present a risk to your collections. If if you think that these collections need to be saved forever and somebody else in the organization is saying, well, we don't need to take care of that, now you've got two people with two different opinions. And if one of them is the other person's boss, then you really have uh, a difference of opinions that needs to be resolved. So you can see there's some risk involved with that. Another organizational risk um, has to do with the, the roles and responsibilities that you have within your organization and your staff. So. Are, do you have enough people? Are you adequately staffed to care for digital collections um, and, and over time? Uh, are the, all of the tasks that are associated with stewarding digital collections, are they assigned 
to people, like written into their job descriptions? Are they accounted for all of these tasks? And are staff adequately trained? And <clears throat> excuse me, often that training needs to be continuing education because this landscape uh, seem, is always evolving and new technologies are coming to the fore that we use for preservation. So I'm just looking at my notes here. There's an example of, of a staff member who, who maybe doesn't have all of the training that they need and they might actually make a mistake in caring for your digital collections that has an impact then on your ability to to preserve them or to um, demonstrate that they're authentic and not corrupt in some way. So, and, and that's not through any malfeasance. It's not a staff member who is out to get your digital collections. It's just that sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So in tra training <coughs> and having clear roles and responsibilities assigned is important. Um, just a, a note on the logo here, the digital archive specialist is a uh, designation uh, that's offered through the Society of American Archivists and that it's it's one of many ways that you can get additional training and in this case credentialing uh, that demonstrates knowledge uh, related to digital archives. Yeah there are classes and modules that you do mm -hmm. some are some are in person um, regionally or at SAA conferences and some of them are online. This never gets old, this cartoon for me. I, I, I feel like it's been around almost my whole career, but um, I just love it. Digitize all the things, and sometimes that's what it feels like. Um, but the problem is, is that this person here doesn't have a selection policy for digital items, and you need one, just like you do for physical items. You're, you can end up with more files than you actually have room to save. Um, it's or, or certainly not any uh, capacity to preserve over time, and maybe you haven't even planned for access. If you're just willy-nilly scanning things, um, you know, there's more to it than that. But I think this audience knows that, which is why we're going to keep moving through the risks. Um, another list is just loss, doing nothing. You can do that with physical collections to a point, right? A lot of physical collections will sit on a shelf and they'll last you for a while. Uh, digital files don't tend to <laughs> to do well over time uh, without a additional attention. Um, this is actually, I would say, the biggest risk uh, to your collections, this, this doing nothing, this feeling like those collections, those digital collections over there are fine and they, they do need attention. Uh, here's a, a group of organizational risks related to resources. You, and you, some of these may resonate with you if you're in an organization where your digitization and your digital collection formation is funded through project-based spending. So it's like, let's do this project, let's do that project, and it's all kind of one-offs. You really want program-based funding. You want it to be incorporated into the annual budget, and yes, this is we are doing these activities, and we do them every year, and they're funded, and they're staffing, and you know, having that formalization really creates the structure through which then you can preserve those digital files. Related to that are resources that you can spend for staff, spend for their training, spend on equipment and maintenance. And even if you're outsourcing all of your, say you're doing analog to digital uh, reformatting, even if you're outsourcing that, you still need equipment in terms of hardware, servers, computers to save those files. Um, so even if you're not doing, you know, equipment is not just scanning, is really, or just scanners, was what I was uh, saying here. And most of us can't actually do everything in-house, so you, those resources will also apply to vendors, outsourcing, and services. And the last organizational risk that I want to mention then is succession planning. Um, things can change. Your organization may um, have a change in leadership. Your, your digital staff may have a change in personnel. Um, your institution might have a change in mandate or mission. There may be something on a larger scale that happens. And when things of that nature occur, it, it can um, unsettle that structure that I was talking about that enables you to preserve your digital collections. So that was a quick tour through technological and organizational risks. Um, there may have been one or two where you were like, oh my gosh, that. Um, 
it's okay. You're here at Atom. Make yourself a note. Take care of it when you get home. Um, but hopefully that's helpful. So now as we go on to preservation strategies, this is where we're going to talk about addressing those challenges. After that, um, I'll zero in a little bit on a digital preservation assessment in particular. So I have nine strategies for you, for those of you who are taking notes in an organized fashion. Uh, number one is planning. We do preservation planning for both our analog and our digital collections. There's strategic planning, there's succession planning. I was just talking about succession of leadership. Um, and all of this planning has to be, should be, tied into your organization's mission and strategic initiatives. And if you're working at, in a structure like a university, they usually require you to make sure that you can connect the dots to the strategic plan or something like that. And that can feel annoying in the moment, but it's, it's good practice. Um, because then it's not just somebody making up a plan and saying, oh, we should do these things. It's like we should do these things because it's in our mission that we will do things um, along these lines. So make those connections to strengthen. Uh, strengthen your ability to protect those collections. So related to those plans, which are generally documents, they're documented. Uh, strategy number two is policies. All kinds of you know, policies that can be uh, useful and necessary in this context. I want to talk about designated community. Um, that's from the OAIS, uh, that term comes from the o OAIS model, which I'll show you later, may be familiar to you. It was actually in a footnote. Um, a design I'm, I'm reading this to you so I can get the wording right. Designated community statement describes users by their knowledge, interest, location, demographics, or other characteristics. The designated community statement provides a foundation for the guiding decisions around collection management, selection, and access. Knowing who an institution serves is as important as knowing what objects and programs it manages. So if you don't have that articulated, that's a good one to do. Um, anything to do with collection development, uh, how you manage rights when you're bringing in electronic, uh, electronic collections, digital collections, or you're creating digital collections, also important. Preservation plan is on here too because that can influence your policies, have its own uh, policies that sort of derive from it. And uh, of course your gift or donor policies or anything to do with accessioning whether it's straight up accessioning, purchasing, or if it's through donations and gifts, you probably have that for your physical collections. It won't look exactly the same, but it can look similar for your digital collections. All very important. Again, this all fits into that structure, structure of protection. So you might have guessed that the next one would be procedures. We've done plans, policies, and procedures. Um, these will support your long-term goals, just as it says here on the slide. I, I want to just shine a light on that second bullet. It also supports your unknown long-term goals. We don't really know what's coming, and maybe there's going to be like the latest thing in electronic, you know, digital collection delivery that you're going to have to respond to, and that it will become your goal to participate and provide that level of service and access to your users. Well, hopefully you've got procedures in place that you can just modify a little bit, and then uh, you can sort of move forward into this new direction. Procedures also enable that consistent implementation and that's important when you've got any sort of uh, succession or transition or uh, transfer happening in personnel or other changes, reorganization in your, in your organization. And all of these, of course, should be fully written down and, and documented. And, and honestly, I, f I have found that challenging in the past because when you have procedures and everyone's on board and you're just doing it, it can be become very, you can be very productive, like a production-oriented, almost assembly line of moving through procedures. And sometimes things get changed a little bit. You don't always update the documentation. It's such a pain to stop and write it down, but you need to do that because that will get you through those transitions and enable consistency over time. Uh, so a fourth strategy is digital forensics. Um, you know, now that we have like 
CSI on television. I feel like the word forensics is just more familiar to us and something that, you know, whereas before it may have come up in more military applications or criminal, uh, like investigative techniques, um, it, you apply it, it also, it also has a home in computer science and now I think it's entered sort of uh, common parlance. Uh, we were aware of forensics well but you may not have thought of digital forensics and this is what we talk about when you're uh, this I would say these are a whole set of uh, activities that help you figure out what type of file you have whether it's readable whether you can render it like can you access it at all um, it, forensics can help you recover lost files from obsolete hardware or using obsolete software that's it's can can help you break that uh, darkness in that door uh, to the things that are obsolete and also and this is where we hear about it like on television and and in the news it can help uh, authenticate a digital file it can help show uh, when that when and how and where that file was created and if it's been modified and that can be um, it's important to us as collection stewards because we want to know that we're, de we're showing something that's authentic and is as unmodified. But if you have digital collections that you hold or you collect due to some sort of uh, legal mandate, it's especially important. In fact, you may be required to do the sorts of activities that will demonstrate that those files remain authentic and um, unchanged. Look at those beautiful old disks. We used to call those hard disks, I swear, because compared to floppy disks, they were hard. But now a hard disk is something completely different. Yeah, I'll get off memory lane there. <laughs> Another strategy is emulation. Um, it's probably kind of pixelated. Yeah, it's a it's an old. Uh, it's a screenshot of an emulator that's emulating an older software, the Claris Works Suite, which I think was actually cutting edge at the time. Everything is cutting edge when it first comes out. Um, and now, if I had something in Claris Works, it would be challenging uh, to access. But if there are cases where you, you might, or a researcher might want to see that document or, or whatever it is, that electronic item. Now I'm thinking of born digital collections. In its original environment, like, um, you know, some famous author who did their writing on a computer and you want to see what it looked like on the tiny little, what were those called? The Macintosh computers that first came out that were about the size of a bread box. So, um, an emulator will do that for you. A sixth strategy, normalization and migration. So this is important and sometimes something that we don't always, um, consistently do. So let me just take a moment to talk through this. There are some file formats that are easier to preserve than others. And so uh, it's a good strategy to choose to normalize the files in your digital collections to one of these file formats that are um, easy to preserve, uh, that are more stable, more reliable, more common. So the slide lists some of the factors that you should consider when you're when you're choosing a file format to normalize to, um, or maybe you're going to migrate it uh, to a new a new format. So, you see these bullets here. You can read them, but I'll mention a few. Widely adopted is important, and the reason we say that is not just because everyone's chosen the best thing, because that's not always true, Betamax, um, but that. When th something is widely adopted, it usually doesn't just disappear overnight. There's usually like, we're phasing out this file format and, and people are like getting on the bandwagon to try to figure out how to turn it into something new that everybody can use and there's support and you can migrate that forward. Um, if it's some sort of boutique file format with some niche software, uh, there may not be any support whatsoever once it goes away. Um, easy, and so because there's documentation available, that is what usually makes it easily 
rendered by other programs and operating systems because the documentation documentation exists to help your IT staff make make those uh, digital files come alive, so to speak. Um, I this last bullet is uncompressed and lossless compression. An uncompressed file is best um, when you compress a file you literally lose parts of it makes a smaller file so you don't need as much space uh, to store it and you don't it doesn't take as long to load um, usually it's just it's just faster for all purposes but there's literally parts of the image that are missing there are algorithms that can make it render you know so it looks okay but um, if you ever wanted to really maybe enlarge it or you really wanted to go in and see what it looked like originally there will be parts missing um, there is lossless compression, and that would be preferable to, to what we would call lossy compression. Um, because then you're not, there's an algorithm that's shrinking the file size, but you're still able to blow it back up. That's not the technical term, but you can reverse the algorithm and you're not losing any parts of that image of the document or the photograph or whatever it is. Um, an example, I, and maybe you do this at home, I know I do, um, if I have TIFFs coming off my camera, I can turn them into JPEGs, which is a, a compressed format, and then I can, those are, easy, those are smaller files, and I can email them to family members and say, you know, here's the photos from the birthday party last week or whatever, um, whereas the TIFFs are simply too big. Um, of course, I can always throw things up into the cloud for them to download, but I don't know about you, but I've got some family members who are like, cloud? So, you know, they want to get them over email. Got to meet your users where they're at. But this is a strategy that we can use. If you have file formats, like I said, that are not widely known or supported, those can be then migrated to, um, into a format like maybe PDF, which is widely used, shall we say. Um, we can have a longer conversation about PDF, but for example, if you that that might be actually a better choice than whatever this boutique uh, file format is that you might have, and then it will make it easier for you to maintain that file over time. When you're doing normalization and migration, there are very specific procedures. There's that strategy that you're following that um, track. Uh, within the metadata what it is that you're doing like when again when it's happening what tool you're using I'm going from this format to that format this is the tool I'm using um, and and there are uh, how to say checks this is actually did I already put it up yeah there are checks that you can do that will compare that file to, to, to check you can check both the file to see if it's corrupt or not. And then if you're changing it to a different format, there are ways to check the content as well. So it's, it's, like, it's like documenting that you've made this change. That's the key. Yeah. So speaking of authentic authentication and fixity, there are tools, there are activities, um, and tests that you can do that will demonstrate whether a file has changed. Um, what you see here pictured on the slide is an MD5 checksum algorithm and you can see, uh, I'm not actually sure why, the, I, I'm assuming those digits are highlighted because it, they're intended to be um, uh, digits that were different. Uh, I think we're trying to demonstrate that uh, the, the checksum is, is looking uh, uh, at a very long string of numbers and is able to determine if there's a, a, a difference. Uh, between the checksum on this file and the checksum on this on this file, and they should be the same. And if they're not, you can uh, your your tool uh, for Fixity will alert you to that. Um, this is so. This is the beauty of digital collections: is that when you're running things like Fixity checks, you can automate those for batch processing because this is not the kind of thing that you do manually. On a on, I mean, you can do them manually, but if you have a large digital collection, it's not sustainable to do that. So you need a, enough of the IT infrastructure and the IT know-how to automate some of these things. Um, you can even like the periodic migration that you might need to make. Like say PDF goes away, um, and we're we all know that we're going to take our PDFs and we're going to turn them into this other 
file format. This is in the future, it's not tomorrow. That ideally would be automated within your digital collections. And you would still do checks again to make sure that nothing went got corrupt as you were doing that migration to the new file format. But that's the only way that you can maintain that that you know the authenticity of your of your digital collections. You know, the box here on the slide about authentication mentions also vandalism and accidental deletion. I have experience with accidental deletion. I don't know about you. That certainly happened where I've had to go to my IT people and say, I know the folder was there yesterday. Can you find it for me? Um, but vandalism, hopefully, is not something that you have to experience but can come up, even with digital files. All right. The eighth strategy out of nine is metadata, our friend metadata. It will help you find and identify and plan and organize your digital files over the long term. And the main thing that I just want to stress on this slide is that there, as you know, there are metadata standards. And we recommend that you choose one that works for your organization and, and use it consistently. Um, that way your staff will become familiar and fluent with it. But also it means that it enables you to do some interoperability with some of the tools that are out there. There are tools, again, for some of this batch processing. There are tools, uh, for example, for uploading to a shared repository or something like that. And these tools rely on pulling information from specific metadata fields. It helps everything get into the right place and identify it in the right way. And we maintain intellectual control over our files. And so if you're just sort of doing a homegrown metadata, um, it, that can be problematic. You may not have the fields and the information in the right place that will enable you then to avail yourself of these opportunities for interoperability with tools and repositories and others. So know what you're using, uh, which metadata schema you're using, and, um, and, and, and be consistent. And I just want to say DCMI up on the screen, that's the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative because most of you probably have heard of Dublin Core, but you may have been wondering, like, where is it on that screen? It's DCMI. And then strategy number nine, this won't be a surprise, storage and backups. And you can see on the slide we have redundant geographically dispersed storage. So um, putting your digital collections on a CD-ROM or a DVD-ROM um, I wouldn't count that. It, it is a backup. It is another copy. Um, as part of a, a long-term preservation plan, we don't feel that uh, optical discs like CDs and DVDs are uh, stable enough in the long term. Um, and I would say that's also true from my own experience. Uh, files and, and music that I've had on optical discs, movies. Um, Back in the day when you could borrow DVDs from the public library, well, you still can, but um, when that was like one of the only ways to or get a DVD from Blockbuster and how often it would skip or an audio book. I used to work in university libraries and then we would get these frantic notes if it's somebody's like, you know, this audio book dropped out at chapter 16, you know, we're like, oh gosh, we're really sorry. And, you know, anyway, I digress. But optical discs are not stable for the long term preservation of your collections. They can be useful, but. Um, you want a combination of storage methods. So just to explain what you're seeing in these pictures, because we don't always, um, for example, see what's on the left. That's um, LTO tape. Uh, linear tape, open, is what it's LTO stands for. And that's a data tape. It's an uh, autoloader, this machine. Um, it's kind of like a robot that just uh, makes your backups and, and uh, moves, the, moves the tapes through. Um, the one in the middle, this is a diagram of a RAID a redundant array of independent disks, which you may have also heard of. It's a type of server that relies on hard drives for storage. Um, and then, of course, yeah, I think you can guess what the right one is. That's cloud storage. Um, so uh, a mix of storage types would be great. And I always joke about how how I, I, I keep copies of my family photos at my mother-in-law's house because she lives in another state. And that's geographically separated from the copies in my house. 
but then I admitted to a few people that that's actually my goal because as a preservation librarian, I should have multiple copies of my family photos, but I haven't actually managed to get them to my mother-in-law's house yet. So that just demonstrates how it can be, you can have good intentions, but it can be hard to manifest them sometimes. So um, do the best you can though, because every step you take towards preserving those files will, will help make it actually, actually happen. All right, so those were nine strategies. Um, I didn't give you explicit information on how to implement or actually do all those nine strategies, but that's, that's why this is just an hour session. That would be a different workshop. Um, maybe this is a good time for me to say that there are resources out there. There are vendors who you can call and be like, explain to me emulation, please. Um, uh, play, your public library may be able to point you to resources. Any DCC, the, comp the nonprofit that I work for, we're funded to do a reference desk, a free reference desk. Many of you, I've told you that, you know, and you just call with your questions and we either answer it or find you somebody who can. So, you know, the strategies will get you going. And if you need more information, just ask is really what I'm saying. And there's a lot of good training through just Sustainable Heritage Network, um, the conference recordings, uh, the vendors who are here, so. One hour won't make you a digital preservation expert, but it can move you on that path. So next I want to talk about digital preservation and assessment. Um, you may have seen these. I just want to shine a light on the fact that there are these curation life cycles, models. That's what you see on the right. That's from the Digital Curation Center. I particularly like that one. Um, on the right is the OAIS model that I mentioned earlier. Do you need to master these? No. Should you have heard of them? Yes. That's why I'm mentioning them. Um, these documents or these models um, have formed some of the foundation of the digital preservation community. So you may hear people refer to them. Um, here are two others. The uh, TRAC and TDR, which you may have heard of. These are um, standards for uh, demonstrating that a, a digital repository is uh, trustworthy and uh, meets certain criteria for long-term preservation. Uh, TDR is a checklist that's drawn from that standards. Um, you see in the bottom corner, there's a new ISO standard. That's an international standard, uh, 16363. You may hear people talking about one, you know, ISO 16363. Um, it's, it's drawn, it's been, uh, drawn from these and is a more current and is actually, these are used for auditing, for assessment, um, particularly for the larger organizations. Um, a track audit is no small thing and it's, it takes years. And um, so I've never worked at an organization that large that would do track, but, and, and you may not either, but you should know that it exists. Drilling down NDSA levels of preservation. Um, this is a great tool if you're not familiar with this. Um, it gives, people also use this as an assessment, a self-assessment tool. You can look at these levels of preservation um, and, and see like, oh, we're level one here and we're level two here and you know, in this one, you're probably not a level four in anything. Most people aren't, but at least your goals are there uh, to aim for level four. So it can be used for self-assessment. I will say that the NDSA levels of preservation are being revised like as we speak. So within the next, well, hmm, I forget when they said the new ones would be out, but maybe by the end of the year. Well, certainly next year. So keep an eye open for that. All right. So the reason I wanted to spend the last portion of the presentation focusing on assessment is because you can, this is how you know what you're doing um, and you're not just leaving the files over here and hoping that everything is fine. You have to look for the risk factors, um, evaluate r risks, face your collection, and I went over some technological and organizational risks that you may face. And then look at, like for example, use an assessment tool to det determine what those risks are and also to evaluate your digital preservation policies, procedures, uh, what plans you have in place, uh, you know, do we have a succession plan, all of those things that you can um, assess, and we'll talk about that. Out of that assessment, is that's how you determine what your next steps are, and then you prioritize those so you know, 
prioritize those so you then know what you're actually going to do first because you can't do it all at once. And that's what you see pic pictured on this slide. So uh, the, I mentioned the NDSA levels. People use that for self-assessment. There are um, other self-assessment tools out there. Let me just tell you that when you're looking for resources, there, it, preservation assessment of analog collections has been around for a long time. In fact, I think Rebecca Elder, or if it's not Rebecca, somebody else right at this minute is doing another session on uh, preservation assessment, but it's of analog collections. We're talking about digital collections and it is slightly different. Some of the same concepts, policies, procedures, but um, different challenges. So uh, we wanted to make sure to share this with you when I proposed this to the ATOM conference committee. The focus was on this particular assessment tool and we didn't have enough time to do a full training for it. So I said, well, I can do it in the context of a, of a, of a, uh, a, a shorter presentation. So let me give you a glimpse at this. I can't train you to use it, but I think you'll see once I talk about it that uh, you won't need a lot of training to use it perhaps. So this is a grant that we've been working on with some other regional conservation centers. And you can see in the bulleted list, these are the, the products of this grant. And so one of the things that came out of it is this peer assessment model. So this is new. Um, as part of this grant, we looked at all the digital preservation tools that people were using and, and got a task force together and we're like, how do you do digital preservation? Like what are the best practices? And I'll tell you where you can find that information in a couple of slides. But we also felt that not everybody can just hire a consultant to come in and do a digital preservation. There may be a digital preservation assessment that it may be cost prohibitive um, or, or for whatever reason, it's just not the right fit. And so it was important to have a, an assessment model that, that could be done um, sort of locally. So initially it was a self-assessment model. And as the task force was developing this, they realized, you know what, that's no good. It needs to be a peer assessment model. It needs to be you working with another organization that might be usually is similar or close to you. There's, there's some sort of connection. And you can co-assess. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so I'll, I'll, let you, I'll show you that um, there's an entire framework for digital preservation peer assessment that's online. You can see we have a tiny URL here that's DigiPres assessment. And the goal of it is to just um, help, help the, your institution document your digital preservation practices, identify the areas where you need, uh, need growth, uh, see any obstacles to that growth, and then create a plan so that you're moving in the right direction. So this is what I was just alluding to, is this model. There's actually two ways you can use the peer assessment. You can, you can do it as an interview where, like, I see that your jacket says Judith, and I'm hoping that's your jacket and your name is Judith, and you're not just wearing Judith's jacket, but Judith and I could sit down, and um, not to put you on the spot, but Judith could interview me about my institution and our policies and our procedures, and, and she could basically be my consultant, be my assessor, and it allows us to focus on my institution. Um, and then I, we can turn the tables and I can do an assessment for you later. Um, but another way to use the peer assessment is co-assessment, actually doing it at the same time. Um, Judith would ask me questions from one section and then I would ask you the same questions about your institution from that same section of the framework. And it enables there to be a little more of a conversation, your ideas kind of bounce off each other and both people benefit from the back and forth. And we might choose to do well, let me show you. These are the five facets of the assessment. We might choose to do organization, you know, in October. We might choose to sit down and talk about staff and resources in December. We could talk about policy and infrastructure in February. You know, we could spread it out that way if that's what works for us. Or maybe we want to sit down in two days and just talk through all of it. There's there's a lot of different ways this model can be applied, but the goal is for you to find somebody uh, to work with, uh, with similar goals, similar like timelines, and that you help each other through this process. So the assessment has these five uh, important facets, 
And then each facet within the framework, there's a recommendations bank. So you can see here characteristics of this uh, recommendations bank. There are suggestions for improvement. It's not comprehensive. They're not ranked in any way. But there's a few examples here, for example, um, like a mission statement. You know, one suggestion would be to create a mission statement if you don't have one, or if you have one to make sure that preservation is included, or make sure that digital, uh, your digital preservation goals are aligned with that mission, um, those types of um, recommendations. And you'll see, depending on the facet that you're working in, some of them are um, very sophisticated uh, recommendations. So the ones that I showed you just then about mission statement are kind of like, well, of course, you know, write a mission statement if you don't have one. But some of them can get quite technical. So it's a matter of sorting through those recommendations, seeing which ones are right for your organization. So related to this, uh, the main, related to this uh, peer assessment and alongside of it deliverable for the grant, is the Digital Preservation Assessment Handbook. Um, this is actually designed for consultants and assessors, and we had a training institute a couple of months ago to train 12 assessors to go out and do digital preservation assessment. Um, once we get their feedback on how that process went, we also did our own eight uh, assessing pilots. Um, then the, the handbook will be finalized. It's, it's really almost in its almost done actually today, but we'll, we'll wait to get feedback from the cohort. It has these components. So there's the framework for assessment that you can access. This is all free online as required by the grant. Um, there's a glossary of terms, which can be super handy for getting everyone on the same page um, and knowing that we're, you know, we're using the same words to talk about the same concepts. There's a pre-assessment questionnaire, which is a really interesting tool because if, say we sit down to talk about parts of the framework, I may not know all the answers. And that's actually often the case with digital collections because there's an IT component and there's um, this whole idea of the born digital, but then there's the reformatted. And so I probably don't know it all. So when I go through this pre-assessment questionnaire, I'm finding, it gives me the time to go around and ask people um, to help me fill in the gaps so that when we sit down to do the actual assessment, I, I don't have as many gaps uh, in my answers. Another component of it is the report template. Um, usually an assessment produces a report and then you can use that as uh, a foundation for a preservation plan. You can hand it to an administrator and say, this is our assessment of the state of affairs with our digital collections. That, that can be quite powerful. Um, you can write up an executive summary at the front of it to kind of uh, give an overview. Um, and then there's also a resource list that's part of this handbook that um, points you in all you know the different directions to the various resources that will help you to do this work. So again, um, this handbook will be out uh, with the, the peer assessment. Um, parts of the peer assessment are already online uh, for your access, um, really within a matter of a few weeks. Once you've assessed your risks, and how you're doing with digital preservation. And I, you can use, again, the NDSA tools. You can actually use the slides from this presentation to help guide a self-assessment, right? You just go through the risk slides, go through the strategy slides, and be like, OK, even just that would give you a sense of where you're at. Then you can prioritize your next steps. I strongly uh, encourage you, even if you don't use the peer assessment model, that you, you look at that recomm the recommendations bank that's part of the report template, because that will give you ideas for your next steps and the kinds of things that you can do. And then, of course, the third piece that I mentioned before is that you have to plan for implementation, because you can't do everything at once. So you might find this grid um, useful. It's a little washed out Oh, on my screen, but it looks fine on yours. Uh, you may have used a matrix like this for planning before. I find it's really powerful. You, you may have a next step, and you see that it's um, has a really high impact, but when you really look at it, it's like totally not feasible and maybe not worth it to go down that rabbit hole at the minute. You want to look for things that are high impact, high feasibility. It can even be, you know, it can be actually really rewarding and create a lot of momentum when you have something that's highly feasible, even if it's low impact, because at least you get it done. 
Um, so that can feel really good. But this is a very simple planning tool, but again, I find it quite effective for figuring out um, what you're going to do next now that you have a list of next steps. So we have a little time left for questions, and you're always welcome uh, to contact us at any DCC, and if we don't know the answer, we'll get you connected to somebody who does. But that's what we're, that's a big part of uh, what we're funded to do, is to uh, answer the questions that come in on the phone and to info at NEDCC.org. But I'm happy to take your questions about the presentation as well. Uh, the 3 two, one rule, I found it. Three copies of your files, two different types of storage media, one copy off-site. So, I mean, you've got three copies and one's off-site, so they've kind of double-dipped on number of copies, and that's why it was confusing for us yeah. <laughs> to remember what 3 two, one stood for. Um, actually, I think if you're not familiar with Digital Power and their resources that are online, Power, P-O-W-R-R, -R, Digital Power, They've been funded to do a wonderful workshop and webinar series, and they have resources online. Um, I think, I feel like they have a three, two, one thing. Mm, I might be misspeaking, but um, so yeah, so so two different types of storage media, and I wouldn't go with your two storage media as like um, flash drive and CD-ROM. Yeah, those would be like not the ones you want to choose. So, cloud and a hard drive. Yeah. Sure. We are at the end of our time. I'll be here for a few minutes afterwards if you have any follow-up, but thank you for your attention, and uh, good luck preserving. <laughs>